North Korea is the most difficult of targets for the U.S. intelligence community to unearth. Intelligence collection and analysis is an incredibly time-consuming and dangerous business, where it often takes months and maybe even years of patient rapport building, and in some cases, blackmail, to recruit an agent or flips an adversary. The Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence don't have that luxury with North Korea. What Washington does have is satellite imagery from above an electronic interception, but even Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats confessed to the Senate Intelligence Committee that using that as an access to a collection is we get very limited results. We do, however, know one thing for certain, in the crazy scenario whereby Kim Jong-un orders his nuclear forces to launch a nuclear-tipped ICBM towards an American city, one, by the way, that would rest on the supposition that Kim is a lunatic who believes Washington would back down after an attack, President Donald Trump wouldn't hesitate to retaliate with the fury and fury of America's nuclear weapons arsenal. There probably wouldn't even be a debate with Defense Secretary Jim Mattis, National Security Advisor McMaster, or U.S. Strategic Command Commander General John Hyten. And if there was a discussion, it would focus on where, not whether, to hit North Korea. Pyongyang, the capital city where millions live, would be the obvious target for a retaliatory nuclear strike. Kim Jong-un would likely be scurried away in a bunker somewhere with his sister and his senior generals long before Washington gave the order to the men and women who managed the U.S. nuclear triad to execute a launch, but that wouldn't really matter.
The purpose of a U.S. retaliatory attack would be to create so much destruction on North Korea's military chain of command, its minuscule economy, its hereditary political system, and its physical existence as a nation that Kim Jong-un wouldn't continue throwing nukes at the problem. Ideally, he wouldn't have any more nukes to launch. Using Alex Wellerstein's nuke map algorithm website, I attempted to determine the extent of the destruction in human terms if the United States targeted the center of Pyongyang with a single 750 kilogram device. The largest nuclear device the United States possesses in its arsenal is the B-83 with the 1.2 megaton yield. Because Pyongyang is a sense city denser than Los Angeles, which is a major urban sprawl one blast of a nuclear device with that magnitude would kill over 1.5 million people. Taking UN population statistics into account, 25.281 million, one 750 kiloton nuclear blast in downtown Pyongyang would wipe out nearly 6% of the North Korea's total population. To better comprehend the deep extent of that damage for North Korea, it would be like killing 19.27 million Americans in one day from one attack. Add estimated injuries into the equation. 855,410, and the casualties would rise to over 2.3 million. As to which structures in Pyongyang would cease to exist and which would only suffer moderate damage, take a look at the map. The workers and visitors of the victorious Fatherland Liberation War Museum in northwest Pyongyang would have a 50% to 90% chance of dying within the first hours, days or weeks from the radiation exposure. Receipts of the Kisan Youth Park slightly to the northeast would be killed as concrete buildings collapsed. Across the Taijun River, the ideals of North Korean workers' facility would have the same bloody ending. The thermal radiation radius, the outer ring of the yield, where people would be dealing with third-degree burns requiring possible amputations, would extend 11.1 kilometers in all directions. Pyongyang skyline wouldn't really be a skyline anymore. All those fancy skyscrapers that Kim spent so much money on would be a wasted investment.
the Pentagon has spent more than $40 billion on the ground-based mid-course defense system, GMD for short. It's designed specifically to thwart a nuclear strike by North Korea or Iran. Yet there are grave doubts about whether it's up to the task. Here is a look at the system's origins, how it's supposed to work and the technical problems that have bedeviled it. It's designed to defend the United States against a limited nuclear attack. That means a strike with a handful of missiles, as opposed to a massive assault of the kind that Russia or China could launch. The United States relies on deterrence, the threat of overwhelming retaliation, to prevent Russia or China from ever unleashing missiles against us. In the case of North Korea or Iran, we would rely on GMD to knock incoming warheads out of the sky. By intercepting incoming warheads in space, just as they're about to begin their re-entry into the atmosphere. That's the approximate mid-course point in a warhead's journey from launch pad to target. The GMD interceptors are 60-foot tall, three-stage rockets. Each has a 5-foot, 150-pound kill vehicle at its tip. In the event of an attack, interceptors would be launched from their underground silos. Once in space, the kill vehicles would separate from their boost rockets and fly independently toward their targets, at speeds up to 4 miles per second. There are 37 operational interceptors, 4 at Vandenberg Air Force Base in Santa Barbara County, California, and 33 at FT. Greeley, Alaska. The kill vehicles carry no explosives. They're designed to destroy enemy warheads with kinetic energy, or energy of motion in other words, by crashing into them. Satellites and powerful radars, stationed on land and at sea, track airborne objects. The GMD system receives data from these and other sources and would use it to guide the interceptors. The kill vehicle also has an onboard navigation system to help it zero in on its target. Intercepting a warhead traveling at hypersonic speed is a supreme technical challenge. It's been compared to hitting one speeding bullet with another. GMD has not shown that it could do that dependably. The system has performed poorly in flight tests, and technical problems keep cropping up. In nine simulated attacks since GMD was deployed in 2004, interceptors have failed to take out their targets six times. And the flight tests are much less challenging than an actual attack would be. They're carefully scripted for success, the operating personnel know ahead of time when mock warheads will be launched, as well as their size, speed and approximate trajectory. They don't assume that. To the contrary, defense planners assume that four or five GMD interceptors would have to be launched for every incoming warhead to have a good chance of destroying them all, according to current and former government officials. That's called the shot doctrine and it reflects GMD's shortcomings. It means that if an adversary launched multiple missiles, our inventory of interceptors could be quickly depleted. It's no single problem, it's a variety of causes. And that's what so concerns experts who've studied the system. In some cases, divert thrusters were blamed. These are small rocket motors, four of which are attached to each kill vehicle. They're supposed to fire rapidly to make course corrections and keep the kill vehicle on course once it's in space and flying on its own. In some tests, the thrusters rough combustion of fuel was found to have thrown off the kill vehicle's onboard guidance system. A lot of time and money was spent redesigning the thrusters to kill this problem. In January 2016, a flight test was initiated from Vandenberg Air Force Base to check out the new thrusters. The Missile Defense Agency and its lead contractors pronounced the test a success. But as the Times later reported, it wasn't. Partway through the exercise, one of the new thrusters stopped working, and the kill vehicle veered far off course. A review overseen by the missile agency found that the thruster most likely malfunctioned because of a glitch in the circuit board that powered it. As the Times reported, circuit boards in most of the kill vehicles now in the GMD fleet are vulnerable to the same kind of mishap. Bottom line, the kill vehicles are tremendously complex machines. Each one has more than 1000 components. 
and because of the speed with which they've been produced and deployed, no two are identical. American scientists have been working on missile defense technology for decades, with the aim of creating a reliable shield for the U.S. homeland. President Clinton, whose administration supported and funded such research, concluded that the technology wasn't ready for prime time. But his successor, President George W. Bush, had campaigned on a promise to deploy a homeland missile defense system quickly, asserting that the country was in imminent danger of a sneak attack by a rogue state such as North Korea or Iran. In late 2002, Bush ordered the Pentagon to field a set of missile defense capabilities by the end of 2004. To speed things along, Defense Secretary Donald H. Rumsfeld exempted the program from the Pentagon's normal procurement and testing standards. Analysts trace GMD's problems to these early decisions to prioritize speed above meticulous engineering and development of proven capabilities. The Government Accountability Office, a nonpartisan investigative arm of Congress, reported last year that GMD's test record has been insufficient to demonstrate that an operationally useful defense capability exists. In July, a team of missile defense experts who studied GMD for the Union of Concerned Scientists said the system is simply unable to protect the U.S. public. In January, the Pentagon's Operational Test and Evaluation Office, in its annual report on U.S. defense programs, rated GMD's reliability as low. It said the day-to-day -day availability, or readiness, of the system's interceptors was also low. The report added that flight tests had revealed unspecified new failure modes. The agency says it is absolutely confident in GMD's ability to protect the homeland. A handful of defense contractors have produced the system's major elements. Raytheon Company has built the kill vehicles and radars. Orbital ATK Incorporated has made the boost rockets. Northrop Grumman Corporation has provided the worldwide communications links. Boeing Company has managed GMD as the government's prime contractor. Some generals have said the cost of an interceptor-based system is unsustainable, and that the US needs to give greater thought to a left-of-launch strategy. That's military speak for taking out missiles before they could be launched, as opposed to trying to shoot them out of the sky. Yet for now the Pentagon is expanding GMD to 44 interceptors, with bipartisan support from Congress. This is not a Trump initiative, it started under President Obama. The government is also studying possible sites for a third interceptor field, in the eastern half of the US that would add up to 60 interceptors to the GMD fleet.